In our last video, when we were talking about Gymshark, I mentioned that we were going to talk about an interesting company. And uh, interesting because of what's happening right now with the pandemic, you know, travel related businesses are taking an absolute hammering on their revenue and their income. Um, it's starting to turn with, uh, with the vaccines. And, and in the UK, we're hearing there are a number of people over 50s are starting to book more travel. Um, so really interesting to see what's going on. Um, so today we're going to talk about Thomas Cook, Ted. And um, they went bankrupt, was it last year or 2018? But when they, when they did so, there was something like 260,000 people that were stranded across different parts of the world. And, uh, and they had to struggle getting back. In fact, they had to pay out of their own pockets with a lot of them. But you and I talked about this company. And in fact, you said, you know, there was actually all the signs were there. So uh, really looking forward to seeing what you've uncovered about the finances and, and how our viewers can actually start to learn some of these things for themselves. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think it was 2019 that Thomas Cook went, oh, bankrupt, right, yes. went bankrupt. And uh, I think the repatriation, they said that the repatriation at the time was the largest since the, uh, the, the Second World War. Although I'm kind of guessing now that the pandemic repatriation probably uh, uh, beat even Thomas Cook. So uh, yeah. it's all running into history. So you're absolutely right. Lots of people booking their holidays right now. And it always reminds me of Thomas Cook because lots of people say, why did no one see it happening? And, and what I want to do today, Moeed, is to say you could have seen it was going to happen, uh, but only if you knew where to look. Mm. So uh, Thomas Cook, don't just book it, Thomas Cook it. You remember their famous strap line. Um, yeah. And we're going to look at the accounts and see were they booking uh, the numbers or were they trying to cook the numbers? So we're going to jump into the accounts. And what I'm showing you right now is the auditor's report, uh, the independent auditor's report uh, to the members. And this was uh, on the 2018 accounts. Mm. Now, there's quite a lot of information in the audit report, but I've highlighted a specific paragraph that says we conclude that the use of the going concern basis of accounting and going concern means they're trading and expected to continue to trade for the foreseeable future uh, is appropriate and concur with the directors and that no significant uncertainty has been identified. Hmm. Now, if you read the kind of the detail, uh, which we're not going to go through, I'm not going to read out this. If you want to, you can you can find the report on the Internet and read it yourself. But if we read the detail, what we see is that, you know, they're aware that there are issues, but the directors are confident that they can overcome those issues and the auditors agree with the directors so we need to be careful here that the auditors report doesn't necessarily mean that if they give a clean set of uh, uh, a clean bill of head to a bill of health to an account set of accounts then the accounts are okay or the company's not going to go bust so that's kind of our first um, uh, learning uh, lesson there mm. so Let's jump straight in and have a look at the accounts. So um, here we've got now I've been watching this company since about 2009. OK, so what I want to do is to share with you the 2010 nine accounts and then we will have a look at the 2018 and 17 accounts and see what's actually changing. And the the first place anybody looks at a set of accounts is usually the income statement and what we find is that if you look at the income statement to this company the problems are already highlighted so this company they're working on a gross margin of 20 percent um mm -hmm. so if i can just uh, uh let me get my annotation up so in effect we're looking at these numbers here um don't worry too much about you know this the fact that they split these two these two columns out is almost irrelevant. We're really focusing on the total column uh, here, uh, okay. and we see that they're turning over about nine million pounds uh, and making a gross profit of two million. I.e., the holidays that we buy the holiday from then for uh, uh, nine million pounds, and they then buy the holiday for seven million pounds, for example. In fact, we're in billions here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it yeah, and that's kind of reasonable. You know, they're, they're in a business where they've, you know, it, it's tight margins. If they try and buy a cheap holiday and sell it to us for too much, 
uh, even in 2010, we're on the internet, we're, we're, we're booking them ourselves directly. So, you know, it, it's a, you know, it's a challenge that they're, they're a low margin business. And then we see the costs of actually running the business, which are here, uh, mm. and that results in the operating profit. And the operating profit is about £167 million, pounds, and that's 2% of turnover, okay? So this is a low margin business. Mm. And the problem is here. And right. we see the finance costs, and it's the cost of servicing their debt. And the cost of servicing their debt in 2010 was 180 million pounds and that is a problem and just to clarify for our viewers what ted means by servicing servicing the debt is very simply the interest that they have to pay on on the debt that they have absolutely so mo if you take out a mortgage personally you fill in these long forms mm. uh, and they ask you stupid questions like you know uh, uh, how much do you spend on socks each month and, and and you look at the bank and go what a stupid question i don't buy socks on a monthly basis but what the bank is really trying to do is to work out can you afford the mortgage so mm. they'll look at your salary but then they want to know that you know the cost of deducting the food you eat because mo if you don't eat you'll die and if you die you won't be able to repay your mortgage and then they look at the cost of travel to work for example because if you don't travel to work then you you'll get made redundant and then you won't be able to pay your mortgage so what they're trying to do is to look at here's your salary here's all the costs you incur running your life do you have enough left over at the end of the month to pay the mortgage and that's yeah. really what we're looking at here we're looking at the income that they earn from uh, the holiday makers, the costs of providing that holiday, the costs of running the business, the money left over, the operating profit is there and it's left over to service the debt. And in 2010, they were struggling to service that debt. Now, the first question has got to be, well, how much debt is there? And why have they got so much debt? Exactly. Now I, I'm going to I'm going to scroll down um, the this uh, this uh, through the accounts. Um, what's interesting before we get to the debt is before we get to the balance sheet, we find a cash flow statement. Now mm. this is the first company I've ever come across where the cash flow statement goes before the balance sheet. Yes. Okay, so it's usually income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. Sometimes it's balance sheet, income statement, but the cash flow is always last. And these guys have put the cash flow much further up. And, I, and I'll explain why a little bit later on. Okay. But we'll drop down to the balance sheet. So here's the balance sheet. And at a very simple level, if you think about it, Moeed, if you're gonna run a, if you're gonna run a travel company, what are the assets that you're going to need to buy to run your travel company? What do you need? Well, whatever you can travel in. So um, planes, uh, ferries, ships. Yeah, you, you uh, can lease the airplanes. You can buy the air. But most travel companies don't buy the ships. So oh, Thomas Cook, point. you know, Thomas Cook buys its own airplanes, but most travel companies, you know, I have a friend of mine who runs a local travel company here. He runs it from his laptop. Right. So he doesn't right. need any assets. Yeah. True. So when we see a company, when we see a company like this with 5.4 billion pounds in assets, and these are the things that we need to run the business. So these are what we call the non-current assets, tables, chairs, plant machinery, equipment, computers for these guys, airplanes. That's interesting. I, I thought, I thought Thomas, Thomas Cook's, not a unique element, but what they do is that because they own those assets, i.e. the planes and even the ferries themselves, uh, that enabled them in some way to be more competitive. But um, but it turns out it was just... Well, they the don't planes, own the... Huh? They're not owning the ferries. So so they okay. owned the aeroplanes because they were they were looking to be able to fly all their, all their passengers to specific destinations. And rather, depending on the standard airlines, they actually started to run their own airlines. Right. But really, okay. for Thomas Cook, for them, it's about buying, you know, they'll go to Benidorm or wherever it is, and they will buy the holidays locally, uh, and yeah. then they will package them up and sell them here in the UK so that I don't have to think about 
booking a flight and a hotel separately, I get the package deal from from Thomas Cook. Effectively, that's what they're doing. OK, wow. but don't forget they're buying locally. So it's not them who are running it. They'll have a rep out there, but it's the hotel owner who's actually, you know, who owns the hotel, for example, not Thomas Cook. It's a model of convenience so what we see, and, and cost savings. Absolutely. Makes life a lot easier. So what's interesting about this company is that they've got all of these non-current assets, these things that they're invested in. They've got a whole lot of aeroplanes, 655 million pounds worth of aeroplanes. And OK, that, that's un understood. But the biggest number is this intangible asset. Now, an mm. intangible asset is something you can't touch. It's something you physically can't touch. So what is it, Moe, you think that Thomas Cook owns that's worth £3.8 billion and you can't touch it? And I'll give you a clue. Don't say brand. I'm struggling to think about what that would be. Um, usually that's... I mean, I know with intangible assets, it's usually the, 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 the system that they use to run the bookings, for example. I know with other Not companies- 3.8 like, billion quid's worth of system. No, There's no, no, way no. And that's why I'm struggling. Because I, I know in our previous video, when we talked about Kazoo, their intangible assets was the, the e-commerce almost platform that they created to be able to select cars, et cetera. But I'm struggling to think what the hell could three, what could be three billion? What could be a cost of three billion Absolutely. for someone like Thomas Cook? So Kazoo had a, had an IT operating system of about 2.8 million pounds. And that's a, a little bit more yeah. reasonable. 3.8 billion. I mean, even the government would struggle to waste 3.8 billion on a new National Health Service IT system. Although, uh, don't quote me on that. And in fact, what we find, if we look at note 12, yeah. we find that it's actually it's goodwill. And if you remember, goodwill oh. arises on the acquisition of another company. Yes. So you may remember back in 2007, what was Thomas Cook up to? Yeah, they they uh, they merged with a company called My Travel, right? Absolutely. So they were very very acquisitive. They were buying companies like My Travel and other operating uh, travel companies. They were growing through acquisition, and how were they funding that growth? Oh, they uh, they funded it through debt, didn't they? Exactly. Yeah. And so what we see here is that they got all this goodwill and goodwill is the difference between what you pay for a company and what you actually get. So when you buy a company, you get the net assets, you get all the assets and all the liabilities. Mm. But if you think about it, if you're going to buy a travel company, all you're actually buying is, you know, a couple of blokes in mum's attic. I mean, that's it. Because that's what you need to run a travel company. So what you're really buying is the database and the reputation. And, that, yeah, and that's an that's, intangible. So we see a very large amount of goodwill arising on acquisition. And that's astounding. And just for our viewers, some interesting facts here. Well, one really interesting fact about my travel. And, and I, you know, I don't understand why they bought them, because in six years, that company had only been profitable once in six years. So, so presumably, pre presumably they were buying them and merging with them because they had a big kind of custom kind of client distribution network of some kind. They, they, they were capturing more market share, but, but at what cost? And you're saying it's almost four billion. Of Absolutely. Cost. And, and, and so what they're doing is that they're, they're not buying my travel. What they're really buying is the database and the reputation. And then they plug it into the into their system that says, we know how to run this database at a profit. And they're running yeah. it, as we said, at a 20% gross profit. Mm. So we can see the debt uh, in the non-current liabilities. So here we go. Here's the non-current liabilities. Uh, and we can see the debt. Um, wow. There's the long-term borrowings uh, very clearly on the, um, uh, on the balance sheet. And they've got some issues on retirement um, and some long-term provisions. So the non-current liabilities is actually pretty high. Uh, and if we plug those into um, a, a spreadsheet, for example, we see that you know, even, in, uh, even at this point, they're about 50-50 debt funded. So it's about 50% debt, 50% equity. The problem is that that was only getting worse. By 2018, it was 88% debt and only 12% equity. So this was a major problem for them. And what we see from the income statement is that they can't, they can't service that debt. Mm. 
Now, one other thing while we're here at the balance sheet, which is worth looking at because we've talked about it before, is the current assets, which mm -hmm. is this number here, and the current liabilities, yeah. which is this number here. Okay. And comparing these two numbers. Yeah. So the current assets, if you remember, we've discussed this. These are things which we own that we either are going to come become cash or we're trying to turn into cash. Yeah. OK, um, so, you know, the non-current assets, tables, chairs, plant machinery, things I need to run the business, the current assets, things which are going to become cash. And the current liabilities are things I have to pay soon, as opposed to the non-current, which is kind of long term debt. So this yeah. is do I have enough cash coming in or as cash to pay my liabilities soon? And the ratio here is one point five billion and three point four billion. Mm. OK, and, and, and if we and if we actually look at that in a in a in a ratio, in a liquidity ratio, that's 0.44. So that says for every one pound we owe and have to pay soon, we've got 44 pence either Good as good. cash or coming in as cash soon. Yeah. So basically what you are effectively saying is they didn't have enough money to pay the liabilities that were due. Uh, actually, I'm not. What I'm saying, oh. Moeed, is that we traditionally look at that relationship, and if it's below one or 0.44, then we start to ring alarm bells. Ah, However, right. Moeed, okay. like everything, it never gives the full story. We need to understand the business model of Thomas Cook. So let me think. Let me ask you this: How much stock? How much inventory does Thomas Cook hold? None. Absolutely, because it doesn't sell it. It sells a holiday. Yeah. So there's yeah. no warehouses full of holidays. OK, so there's no right. inventory. If you go into a Thomas Cook and book a holiday, do they say, Moeed, pay me in a couple of months time? No, they say pay us now. Absolutely. So you put a deposit down as soon as possible and you pay before you go. So mm. what you'll notice here is that the inventories are incredibly low mm. and also when you look at the trade and other receivables, mm. the number's quite high, but actually in this number here, the actual uh, amount owed by their customers is effectively zero. Right. Now, Moeed, if you're a big Thomas Cook and you're negotiating with the owner of the hotel in Benidorm, when are you going to negotiate those payment terms? Well, you're probably going to negotiate those payment terms for after you receive the money. Absolutely. Well, not, prob not probably, you are. Yeah. And after they've been on holiday. Yes. So in in uh, in 2010, they were negotiating. It was 55 days after the holiday. It took them 55 days to pay. Right. The, the hotel. Right. So this is a very strong cash flow business. OK, so they're getting cash in long before they pay that cash out. OK. And that allows them, therefore, to operate at this low at this uh -huh. low uh, uh, liquidity ratio. Right. So, Moeed, why do you think the cash flow statement appears so high up the uh, uh, so high up the um, uh, the order of uh, pecking order? Because it tells a better story. Absolutely. So, what they're doing is they're saying, yes, we're not that profitable, but we're very strong on our cash flow. And you can see their cash flow from operating operating activities. The, in in two thousand and ten, that we're actually looking at. Um, they made a profit of about three million pounds, but we can see that their cash flow is about three hundred million pounds. OK, so what they're saying to their shareholders is it's OK. We've got very strong cash flow. Unfortunately, it doesn't all come through to the end. So we've been watching this company, as I said, I've been watching this company for many, many years. Um, if we jump forward to 2018, here they are. Um, you'll see that you know they're still selling about nine million, nine sorry, nine billion pounds worth of holidays, nine nine point six billion. So they're not mm. growing at all. The operating margins are pretty much the same. You'll notice that it hasn't really changed. They're still their operating profit. There's uh, the operating profit of about a hundred million pounds, ninety-seven million pounds. They're still struggling to service the debt. It's costing yep. them 55, 155 million pounds in interest alone. Mm. And don't forget, 
the interest. They're not trying to repay the debt. They need to refinance that debt. They need to yeah. roll it over. But actually, Thomas Cook has got too much debt. They need to start paying it down. Mm. By this point, it's 90% debt funded. Gosh. There's the previous figures the previous year that they're, they're just about they're just about booking a small profit. Here they're making a pretty big loss. They're sailing very, very close um, uh, to the wind. Um, let's, let's scroll down. Let's look at that debt, actually. So uh, again, um, we've got the cash flow uh, very high up, still generating lots of cash. Let's look at the balance sheet. Let's go and look at their non-current liabilities. Um, and we can see the long-term borrowings. Well, they were trying to bring it under control, but it's it's at now it's at a billion pounds. So they got a billion pounds of, of, of long term borrowings. There's yeah. no prospect of being able to repay it at the moment. They're not just they're just not generating sufficient cash. They're struggling to be able to service it. At some point, the creditors, the people who've lent the money are going to run out of patience and say, you know what, we're not going to lend you anymore. So really what this story is telling us is this is a company that's been in financial difficulties for a very long time. Travel, quite a fickle business. If you're going to run a travel company, you've got to run a strong balance sheet. You've got to have a really good, solid balance sheet with a bit of cash in the bank to be able to weather the storm. Uh, whether it's a global financial crisis or a pandemic, you, you just need to, you know, a little bit more strength than these guys had. I mean, they were especially buying back their own shares in 2007, for example. Yeah, especially with that, that amount of debt as well. Exactly. And so every year they're rolling over their debt, they're negotiating, they've got a 12 month facility, they're negotiating with the providers, they're renewing it, it's not a problem. And, the, it, it, and it's not a problem until one day, the people just go, you know what, we're not going to refinance, we're not going to renew, we want our money back. Yeah. Suddenly they go, we haven't got it. And you can see that the net assets, I mean, they're only 300, you know, less than 300 million pounds on debt of a billion. So there's nowhere to be nowhere to absorb. And so what the what the creditors are going to do is say, well, sell your assets. Well, mm -hmm. what are their assets? I mean, they haven't got any. It's all goodwill. OK, so they need to package up the different parts. You know, you can sell the airplanes, you know, and there may be other um, uh travel companies who will buy the database of Thomas Cook, for example, but they know this is a distressed sale and distressed asset sales come at much reduced prices. So yeah. the providers of the debt will have taken a haircut um, uh, on, on, their, on the amount that they've lent and there'll be nothing left for the shareholders. So this really, was, this really wasn't a surprise then, right? If you know what you're looking for and, and if you just dug into the accounts a little bit more, you would have seen a story of a, of a company that's quite frankly, hanging by its fingernails off the edge of a cliff. And it's been doing so for quite some time. And at some point, you know, the, the, whoever the debtors were, whoever, sorry, whoever the, the lenders were, at some point they're going to say, right, we want our money back and uh, no one else is going to lend you anymore, which is exactly what happened, right? They tried to, they tried to um, get some refinancing for the debt. I think they had a Chinese company, um, you know, in advance talks with a Chinese company willing to give them money, but it just wasn't, it just wasn't uh, in time. And Absolutely. Uh, that was it. And, 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 it, and it comes back, and, and this has been around for a long time. So uh, Ernest Hemingway wrote a book called The Sun Also Rises. Uh, yeah. And there's a wonderful quote in there from a chap called, one of the characters called Mike, and he's asked how he went bankrupt. And he says in two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And that's exactly what's happened to Thomas yeah. Cook. You can see you can see the writing on the wall. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. And when it happens, it's like a dam bursting. You know, you, you know, the, the, the pressure builds up, the pressure builds up. But everyone goes, well, the dam is still there. Everything's fine. And then suddenly, bang, it goes. And when it goes, whoom, it goes properly and it, and, it, and it causes the right mess. So this is very interesting, especially for our viewers who might be entrepreneurs or even salespeople. Um, actually, even even those in R&D, for example, if you're going to partner with a company, these are some of the things you want to really look at. You know, do they, what kind of debt do they have, especially, especially um, non-current uh, liabilities? Um, you know, is there any debt that's wrapped up in goodwill, for example? Are they able to service that debt? And how long has this been going on for? Because you want to know that that company you're partnering with is actually going to be around for the future. You want Absolutely. to know if you're going to sell to that company, 
um, you know, are you going to put in all that effort and good and good work only for them to not be able to pay you, uh, which is really unprofitable for you and a waste of time, actually. So, so this was very, very interesting to look at because, quite frankly, it was something that you could have seen and if you just know where to look at. And you're absolutely right. And, and you know, Coca-Cola, for example, 65 percent debt. But it's not a problem for Coca-Cola because they're making lots of money. They can easily service that debt. So it's, right. it's just not an issue for them. So it's looking at the service, look for the debt, look for the serviceability of that debt and look at what that debt was used to buy. If it was used to buy tangible assets, there's a bit of security to the lenders. But, it, uh, you know, goodwill is an intangible asset. You can't put goodwill on eBay and sell it. Um, right. I got a question for you, Moeed. Mm. Um, Obviously, 2020 was a bit of a struggle, but um, are you, did you go on holiday in 2018 or 2019? Oh, yes. And did you go with a holiday company? No. Okay, so you, you probably booked it yourself. But if you ever do go with a holiday company, do you check their accounts to check their financial viability before you book the holiday? Uh, good question, Ted. I will now. <laughs> I definitely will now. Well, that, fortunately, that is... don't forget, as an individual, you do have protection so that you need to make sure that your uh, the company you're booking with is at all protected. There's ABTA. Uh, both of these are UK based protection. And that means that when companies like Thomas Cook go bankrupt, the insurance company will pick up the tab and will sort it out. So we did get everybody back. It involves some government uh, intervention. Uh, we, ha we had stories of people who weren't allowed to uh, check out of the hotels because the hotel hadn't been provided, hadn't been paid. And of course, if you're a hotel operator, Thomas Cook isn't going to pay you until, you know, 80 days. In fact, it, I think it's 88 days uh, by the end. So you're not going to get paid for 90 days after the people have left, mm. whereas, um, uh, you know, you've already paid up. So the, the holiday makers, they pay Thomas Cook in advance. They go to the hotel. Thomas Cook goes bust. And the hotel owner says, I haven't been paid. You're not leaving until you pay the bill, for example. So yes. I, I don't know if there are any stories of people actually, you know, ultimately being out of pocket. I know that people struggled at the time, but hopefully at all. ABTA, travel insurance, all yeah. of these, it's really important that you make sure that you're covered so that if the company does go bust and it does happen, then you're adequately protected. Yeah, yeah, I, I was going to say travel insurance. In interestingly enough, uh, in my old days where, when I was in sales and, you know, traveling about, you know, 70 to 80 flights a year, uh, I went to meet a, a client in um, Denmark, south of Denmark, and back then, there was a little known flight company that um, would fly from this one city into Germany, which would then be a hub for me to get back to London. Interestingly enough, that airline, when you booked a ticket with that airline, they had not one, but two, option, two options to buy bankruptcy insurance. So we never flew with them again after that, um, because that definitely sent alarm bells ringing. So it's... Yeah, it's yeah. This, this Thomas Cook is not a one-off. It's not an isolated thing. It, it, it's a real thing that happens around. So, so be sure to look out for the finances of the business and protect yourself, as, as Ted mentioned, with travel insurance and make sure they're at all protected or some sort of protected by some sort of nationally recognized body. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, great, great one. And uh, contrary to what you said on last, uh, on last video, I, I thought this was a very interesting topic, actually. So uh, I was, uh, I really enjoyed this. And certainly gave me some food for thought and i've learned a lot of things there so thank you for that Ted. excellent well good to speak to you again moeed and hopefully we'll all be back on our uh, airplanes back on uh, going on holiday again uh, this year uh, and uh, making sure that none of the companies we book with go bust fingers crossed <laughs> thank you Ted.